Hello, welcome to Vermont Press Bureau's Capital Beat. I'm Steve Pappas, editor at the Times Argus. Today I'm with Josh O'Gorman and Neil Goswami, both writers for the Vermont Press Bureau. The Press Bureau is the State House arm of coverage for the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald. So these two guys spend most of their time at the State House during the legislative session and uh, traipsing after the governor and such. Uh, in just a few days, the legislative session will be opening and there are plenty of topics that we are going to be discussing today as a look ahead to the session and the uh, key issues that the legislators will be taking up. Uh, a major one, gentlemen, is going to be on the second day uh, where the Legislator is, legislature is going to vote on who our next governor will be. Um, talk a little bit, Neil, about how that came about and uh, what we can expect. Well, as most viewers will recall, the governor did not get 50% of the vote. No candidate received 50% of the vote on election day. And the Vermont Constitution requires the legislature to elect the governor when that happens. So on uh, January 8th, all 180 members will gather in a joint assembly. They will uh, cast ballots and choose from Governor Peter Shumlin, the Democrat, Republican Scott Milne, who uh, in, the, in the vote came in just about, I think, 2,434 votes shy of toppling the governor. And, uh, and then the distant third place uh, libertarian, Dan Feliciano, who had about 4% of the vote. Uh, it was a pretty shocking election result for all of us who, who follow and cover this. Um, we had seen some polling numbers in October uh, that, that showed a double-digit lead for the governor, but still under 50%. Um, and uh, sort of in hindsight reporting, we, we now know that the governor and his team knew it was going to be much closer uh, on election day, and it certainly was. Whether they thought it was going to be that close still is, is unknown. Uh, Close, I guess, is a relative term. Right. Uh, but regardless, the first action in the legislature this year will be electing the governor, and it's uh, all but assured that Governor Shumlin will be reelected. Re it would be a major uh, upset and surprise if the Democratic-led legislature did not select him. Uh, are the are, are both candidates at this point? And they're not candidates, I guess. Uh, well, in a way, they are. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, in some ways, they are. I mean, there's there's a political uh, commercial that came out last week, funded by what Vermonters for Truth in Government, I believe, right. uh, that are advocating for Vermonters to contact their legislators and urge them to vote for Scott Milne on election day. So, in a way, there is a second campaign going on. There's there were two major issues with uh, the election outcome that could have drastic differences in uh, in how people vote. And this is a secret ballot vote. So people, mm -hmm. the, the lawmakers don't actually have to give a reason why or uh, indicate anything on the ballot other than a name right. that goes into the box. Um, but Josh, what are the issues? I mean, there, there's, if it goes according to the party, you have one outcome. But mm -hmm. if you go by district, legislative district, we could have a completely different outcome, probably still with Peter Shumlin winning, right? Well, it, it's, it's hard, hard to say. Um, if you go strictly by party lines, then without a doubt, uh, Shumlin's got roughly a two to one majority over um, re re Republicans in the House, and so if people, in the House and the Senate. So if people were to vote strictly along party lines, then uh, Shumlin will indeed be our next governor. Mm -hmm. um, however, if we wanted to count strictly by legislative district, districts, it comes down, interestingly enough, to a 90-90 tie. That was, that was some work that you did shortly after the election right, that right. Uh, showed that, in fact, if people in every legislative district vote solely by how their constituents voted at the governor's election in November, then we'll find, in fact, it would be a 90-90 tie. And they'll have to keep voting until there is a majority. Right. But we already know that's not going to happen. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Plenty of folks uh, have already said how they will vote one way or the other. And even in districts where Milne uh, won, uh, those, those legislators have said that they're going to vote for Shumlin or vice versa. So uh, we, we know it's, it's not going to be a 90-90 tie uh, as much as we might like yeah. enjoy that and covering it. Uh, and it's probably a fair bet that it's going to be a two-to-one margin when it all is said and done. Have the candidates been actually reaching out to the legislators, or are they allowed to? 
they're allowed. They could do anything they want. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Milne said he might uh, run his own television ad, mm -hmm. uh, trying to convince people that he's the right guy for the job. Mm -hmm. uh, Milne is saying that uh, he's not calling folks, but folks are calling him, and he'll talk to them if they do. Um, I spoke with House Speaker Shap Smith, who said, uh, you know, they're not twisting any arms or telling anyone how to vote. They're allowed to do, you know, the Democratic caucus can vote however they want. And he wasn't sure if the governor or his team were reaching out to individual members of the Democratic caucus. So, uh, you know, I think the governor is fairly confident that, that uh, his party will pull through for him. And, you know, as I said earlier, it would be a pretty major shock if, if they didn't. Mm -hmm. There has been talk about, uh, after this process is done, about possibly changing, ma making a move to change the Constitution so that m maybe it, mm -hmm. we get out of this gray area. Is that really necessary, do you think? Well, I mean, if you look at how other states do it, it's pretty unusual to have a uh, gubernatorial election decided by a legislature. Um, my sister, who's back visiting from California, when I told her about the scenario where no candidate got 50%, she assumed, oh, there's going to be a there's going to be a runoff. I said, no. In fact, our legislators are the ones who make the final decision. Mm -hmm. um, getting a change to the Constitution is pretty challenging. You have to do it in two consecutive bienniums, I, I believe. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what we're looking at right now is that if Shulman is, in fact, uh, elected by the majority of the legislators here in January, as a lot of people are expecting is going to happen. It's going to be two of his last three terms. He's going to be elected by the legislature, not by the voters of Vermont. Right. And for some people that's troubling, and for other people I suppose that's not. Scott Milne has said that if he wins, he, he does have a budget in, in mind. He hasn't given any details, um, but the governor certainly and his budget writers are trying to come up with something to offset a pretty significant gap uh, going into this legislative session. That's one of the challenges, but let's talk about it specifically. What is the state of Vermont up against and how does it change kind of the tone of the future, for the future? Because this budget may redefine how we approach budgets going forward. That is, uh, that is sort of the indication that the governor is putting out there as we head into this. Uh, we're looking at a $100 million budget gap that's on top of rescissions and uh, gaps in, in past years. <coughs> we just did a, uh, a $30 million rescission in August. They're looking at about $17 million, I believe, by through January, additional uh, rescission. So we have what the governor calls a structural deficit. Um, and that's because the budgets have been based on projections of revenue growth that haven't panned out. They expected 5%, we are seeing 3% revenue growth. So that really sets you up for um, a, a bad bottom line mm -hmm. when you're expecting more money to come in and you count on spending that. So what, what needs to happen uh, is, is they need to figure out how to build budgets uh, that are more sustainable and aren't counting on what right now is phantom money that's not coming into the state. Um, th there has been talk about possibly looking at uh, eliminating entire programs rather than pick, picking the pockets of uh, each program throughout state government. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the governor and his team are looking very closely at all programs across state government and all agencies and departments to determine what's the most effective, what's not working so well, what the state could live without. Uh, but the bottom line is the, the budget that he introduces for the uh, 2016 fiscal year is likely to be much, much different than what we've uh, seen in past years. And there's also talk about how the, the state has found one-time sources of money in the last three or four years to balance budgets. And um, a lot of folks are saying, well, that, that money is gone now. Mm -hmm. We've sort of tapped all of the resources we have to patch budget holes, and now is why we need to fix the structural deficit. So I'm sure you have a lot of advocates out there that are concerned that their program or their interest is going to take a hit uh, mm -hmm. as we move forward. Governor Snelling, when he was governor, brought in an approach that put in cost controls but also raised revenue in the form of certain taxes and right. fees. The governor, Governor Shumlin, has kind of shied away from approach that does both. Mm -hmm. um, his position has softened on that, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, 
he has been adamant for his, the first four years of his uh, governorship that he did not want to raise revenue. He didn't want to tinker with taxes in any way. Um, he is sort of saying that he's taking nothing off the table now, which, um, based on his previous speech, uh, is is a pretty good shift and, and an indication that he recognizes uh, the weakened position he's in as he enters this third term. Mm -hmm. uh, and he knows that lawmakers have sort of been uh, uh, frustrated with him that they that he won't look at uh, any additional source of revenue. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues that the state faces. One of them is Medicaid uh, and finding a, a way to, to fund Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a matching federal program. So the more the state can put in, the more the federal uh, government kicks in. So one of the things that Speaker Shaft Smith mentioned to me recently is that the state may need to look at raising additional revenue f specifically for Medicaid uh, to bring in those additional federal dollars. So I think we're likely to see um, whatever the governor puts out in his budget, if in his proposed budget, if uh, it doesn't include any revenue enhancements, I think uh, lawmakers are likely to design their own budget that does include some. Yeah. Josh, one of the issues that uh, <coughs> has come off the table um, or, or, or is off the table and, it, and back on the table in a different form is that single payer is now been scrapped. The governor walked away from it after the financing plan looked untenable. Um, do we have any indication of how that conversation is going to shift and what we can expect from uh, lawmakers in the course of, you know, proposals that might, I don't know, supplement mm -hmm. an idea of single payer? Because some have said it's not dead, mm -hmm. but for all intents and purposes, it appears it is. Well, I mean, Governor Shulman has said that he's open to any idea that might potentially work. You know, mm -hmm. and he he suffered a very bitter defeat. I suppose he called it the most what bitter, most uh, biggest disappointment, biggest, biggest of, his disappointment of his political career. And um, he said just re recently that he's open to any ideas, and so it's certainly conceivable that uh, the legislature might come up with an idea that somehow if you can just move those economic shells around that you can find a way to pay for this that doesn't include a nine and a half percent hike on your income tax and eleven and a half percent hike on your payroll tax right um, now whether there's the political will to do that in the legislature is something that i would question i think i think that um republicans in the legislature are very very relieved that this is not going forward i think there's a lot of dem i think there's a lot of dems that are very happy that this isn't necessarily going forward mm -hmm. and so i think yes you, you might see some advocates who are going to push for this, but I don't see there's going to be a lot of political will mm -hmm. uh, to continue the single payer effort in the upcoming session. But the, the criticisms are still going to remain there because the health exchange still isn't yeah. at 100 percent. So the the uh, <coughs> the public financing of of health care is off the table for right. this session, and I don't think you're going to see many people. Uh, you don't think the Republicans upset. will have a plan for that? No, no. So that that is off the table for now. And what happens now is the conversation surrounding health care shifts from how we're going to pay for it to uh, a lot more about how much we're paying and, and why we're paying this way. Mm -hmm. uh, payment reform is sort of the buzzword right now. And uh, the governor talked a lot about fee for service where doctors are paid based on the number of tests they run and, and, uh, and how we need to get away from that to a sort of a system that's based on the, the health outcome mm -hmm. and how healthy somebody is after the doctor has worked his or her magic. So I think payment reform and working with the Green Mountain Care Board, the sort of regulatory authority over healthcare matters in Vermont, to lower the cost of healthcare is going to be the focus. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the, the conversation around healthcare is um, diminished at all, it's just changed. Mm -hmm. And of course you will have, you know, Chris Pearson, the uh, progressive leader in the House, uh, he, folks like that will be very adamant about continuing the conversation about uh, how we finance healthcare and needing a public uh, system. That isn't really, it's got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. it's, it's done for now, we know that, um, but we'll still hear from, from folks who really believe in it that we need to continue it. Mm -hmm. Josh, the issue that is going to be front and center is gonna be education, mm -hmm. which is right on your, your beat. Mm -hmm. Um, talk us through what the, there's two kind of pieces to this. Mm -hmm. 
What are we, what are we going to see then? Where are the battle lines going to be drawn? Well, I mean, it's uh, there, yes, there are two separate issues that are kind of t tied up in this. And one is uh, pro property tax, you mm -hmm. know, and um, informal polling and just um, discussions in, in our letters to the editor section and just people on the street. We've heard that uh, maybe this is the year that folks need to, that the legislature needs to do something to revisit the way that uh, we pay property tax and also what we pay property tax for. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of our property tax dollars go to support our education system, which is the second component. Our education system is just hemorrhaging money. We're seeing rising costs with declining enrollment, uh, lower pupil counts, um, and uh, you're seeing, a, and going back to health insurance, you're seeing uh, health insurance as part of a teacher's uh, compensation package just increasing every year. Mm -hmm. So there's some discussion, there's, there's a number of proposals, but one of them is decoupling the idea of property tax and education funding. Mm -hmm. um, so there are notions of having a, there's a legislative working group um, that uh, Shep Smith put, put together that had a host of um, proposals, some of which contradicted each other, but it's good to put everything on the table. And so one of the proposals is to have a single statewide property tax that would be significantly lower than what people are paying now and instead fund education through uh, income tax. Mm -hmm. Now that income tax be based on your region. So if you live within a school district or a supervisory union and you vote for your school budgets there, that your tax, <coughs> that your income tax rate is gonna be based upon this. Mm -hmm. And the idea is the whole skin in the game argument. Uh, some, some critics will say that the current funding system, uh, given income sensitivity and given the fact that some people are not property owners, that there are a lot of people voting on school budgets who in fact aren't really necessarily <laughs> impacted by whether those budgets pass or not, I mean, they're not impacted by a rise in their, in their property tax. Mm -hmm. um, there are also uh, proposals, again, to increase um, proposals to somehow cons cons consolidate. Mm -hmm. um, so look, looking at ways to save money, which is, this, which is the other component. You know, you can change the way that you fund education, but if you don't change the amount of money you're spending on education, we're gonna have the same problem. You're just, you know, digging deeper into the other pocket. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's proposals, again, to increase incentives to encourage school districts to consolidate so you can have, like, uh, a sharing of, say, special education services and transportation services. Um, however, we've had these incentives on the books since 2010, and thus far, the carrot approach has not been working. Right, um, it's only so, been a handful of yeah. districts, schools that have actually very, taken advantage of very, it. Very, very few. Right. Um, Chittenden East recently voted right. to, to, to consolidate um, down in <laughs> southern Vermont. The school district uh, that contains Land Grove in Peru and uh, I think Londonderry mm -hmm. uh, uh, consolidated and created a red regional education district. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far, it hasn't, hasn't been successful. The all carrot approach has not encouraged people really to consolidate. Mm -hmm. um, so you might see, in addition to the carrot, a stick, uh, which is what I've been, uh, which is what I've been hearing that there's going to be some sort of mechanisms put in place to penalize school districts that continue to operate small schools. Uh, that they're going to see the small school grants disappear, mm -hmm. and it's going to be financially onerous on uh, communities who really choose to keep open these small schools and not share services. The lawmakers, uh, there's, there's a discussion at that level, but at the local level, there's also the discussion that this is um, not necessarily palatable. And is the local control uh, issue and discussion really relevant, or is it is it an old conversation that just needs to go away at this point? Well, you know, everybody wants to tout local control, but they don't necessarily want to talk about local responsibility for that control. You know, your local school board and the people who vote on the budget, um, they control your staffing levels. Mm -hmm. They control whether or not you combine grades, if you close schools, if you consolidate. All of these pressures that are being placed on the education fund as a whole are coming from local communities. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Local communities did, will again point their finger back at Montpelier, and justifiably so, because Montpelier places a lot of um, mandates on them that they then have to figure out, be it universal pre-K, uh, finding ways to support du dual enrollment, um, having to find out a way to, uh, to put every child on in an individual learning plan. Mm -hmm. These are all things that Montpelier mandates and then the school districts have to scramble and do. Um, but at the same time, when you have 85% of your of the education fund budget is uh, for sas for sal salary and benefits, I mean, it isn't just uh, mandates that are coming down from Montpelier. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be looking at pensions again this year? Um, yeah, I don't know who has the courage to actually do that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I imagine people are going to look at pensions. Uh, you know, a couple. You know, a big stressor on the uh, education fund. 
um, is the fact that the teacher's pension, the, the teacher's retirement account was transferred from the general fund into the education fund. Um, so that puts some, some stress for sure on the education fund and therefore the property taxpayers who are supporting that ed fund. Yeah. Yes, you might, might have a look at that. You might have a look again coming back to healthcare. Uh, the fact that uh, teachers' health care plans are very expensive, mm -hmm. um, that they have better insurance than you or I. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's going to be some discussion, well, can there be concessions there? But those concessions are done at the individual board level, right. again, because boards negotiate their individual contracts. So what Montpelier is going to do about it, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Neil, are there other third rail kind of issues that are going to come up this session? Um, or what are we expecting now to be the, the big talking points that single payers kind of off the off uh, I think you'll see, well, advocates will come back and be looking for paid sick leave. Um, you know, the legislative leaders last year were adamant that the votes were just not there. Uh, they were accused of not having the, the political will to do sick leave and raising the minimum wage at the same time. But it, by all accounts, it does appear that the votes were simply not there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, legislators just weren't, weren't uh, willing to support that. So I, I have a feeling there's going to be a strong push now that uh, single payers off the table for, for paid sick leave. Um, again, marijuana, legalizing marijuana is likely to come up. Um, I don't think it moves forward this year. Again, it does not look like there's the votes or that leadership really wants to move that through this year. They think there's still uh, time and lessons to be learned from Colorado and Washington State about how that's going before Vermont moves forward. And, you know, we're not going to be the first, so why rush is sort of the, the argument at this point. Um, I think with all of the problems uh, with Fairpoint, uh, you might see something come up along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that uh, there's much the legislature can do, but it's my understanding that Fairpoint does get some subsidies from the state to help with their rural uh, delivering of services. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would imagine that that could be used as a, as a threat mm -hmm. um, for, to get A, to get Fairpoint back to the bargaining table and to work out a contract with its workers, mm -hmm. and B, to, to really improve its game because by all accounts, it's a terribly run company in, in Vermont and elsewhere. You know, the, the number of complaints, consumer complaints is skyrocketing. Uh, people are just uh, not pleased with the service they're getting from Fairpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite possible that uh, the legislature will use whatever leverage it has to force uh, some changes there. Mm -hmm. Earlier this fall, the uh, coalition of uh, about 30 different organizations rolled out the idea of a carbon tax, mm -hmm. uh, which was met with resistance from both parties, actually. Shep yeah. Smith indicated that he probably wouldn't roll it out. And <coughs> certainly the Republicans are saying, why would you put a tax on right. fossil fuels from our major oil dealers and others? Um, does that have any traction? Uh, it, traction in the sense that you put an idea out there, you let it sort of fester a little bit, and then you can come back to it later after people have sort of uh, digested it a bit. Uh, it's not going to pass. We're not going to see a new carbon tax this year. Uh, I, b I would think somewhere down the road this is an idea that's going to be uh, embraced across the country as we sort of deal with the realities of climate change and, and uh, um, a dwindling fossil fuel source and the need to sort of invest in other types of fuel sources and energy sources, mm -hmm. but definitely not, <laughs> definitely not this year. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> both, both of you guys, <laughs> the two sick Battling for, uh, so. colds, yeah. Um, <laughs> the legislature uh, in this past November did have a little bit of a, a shakeup. We saw turnover in mm -hmm. 11 races, yeah. um, two in the Senate, nine in the House. Uh, is that sugaring out to appear to have changed the dynamic of the legislature at all? Uh, well, f for the first time in however many years, four or six years, the uh, um, the House will not be will not have a legislative uh, uh, veto-proof authority, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or supermajority as they call it. There, there are, I think over fifty 
53 seats now in the House for Republicans. So, uh, you know, before the, the House could jam anything it wanted through with the help of some progressives and independents, uh, and then even if the governor didn't like it, they could override that veto. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Senate, the, there's still a supermajority. I think they're up to nine uh, seats in the Senate for Republicans. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the Republicans still have very little power. Um, they can use some um, parliamentary maneuvers to slow things down, but essentially they have no authority or power to stop things that they don't want. Um, it's not like Congress where they can filibuster or... Um, you yeah, know. Let's not give them any ideas. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so in the grand scheme of things, yes, they, they grew, and that's good, good news for Republicans in Vermont. Uh, the Republican Party had seen a steady decline, and this is sort of reversing the trend. So we'll see if it becomes a, a long-term trend where they bring more balance to Montpelier. But um, for all intents and purposes right now, it does very little to impact policy. Josh, the governor pretty much got slapped in the election, regardless of what the outcome was. He claims he got the message that he's been humbled by what Vermonters want and saw a lot of the folks who voted against him as a protest vote, probably from his own base. Are we going to see a different kind of Peter Shum on this session? Well, he's, he's certainly exhibited signs of what could be considered humility um, over the past month. Now, whether that will translate into the day-to-day -day leadership that he exhibits um, when he's there, especially after uh, January 8th, assuming he is uh, re-elected for a third term, We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you at a recent press, press conference, I didn't see much indication of, of change from him and that uh, he shrugged off questions that were kind of, kind of pertinent uh, related to uh, property tax reform um, and education funding and uh, shrugged off a lot of questions regarding the sink single payer that I think you would just assume put behind him at, at this point. Right. Um, so do, I believe there's really going to be a different or humble Peter Shumlin. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is whether or not he's actually going to wield the same measure of power that he had during his last term when he was elected with, I think, a 68% uh, turnout, or, or, six, or he received 68% of the vote. Right. Um, I don't think that he's going to he might think he has that same amount of power going into this term, but I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. Yeah. I think, well, I, th I just want to say, I think we won't really know uh, whether there is a, a humbled uh, Peter Shumlin until we get into the legislative session. And we'll see in his budget proposal, we'll see in how he and his administration deal with lawmakers as they uh, inevitably, you know, butt heads over policy. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to stand up at a press conference. It's hard to change who you are. And the governor is a very self-assured man. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess we'll see how it goes when, uh, once they're into the thick of the legislative session. Yeah. Well, with that, gentlemen, we've got to go. But we, uh, you will see one of us or two of us at a time uh, throughout the legislative session bringing you updates on Capitol Beat, the Vermont Press Bureau, here on Orca Media, uh, and we appreciate your time today. Uh, Joshua Gorman and Neil Goswami of the Vermont Press Bureau, thank you for walking us through what could be a very historic session. Thanks. Thank you. All right.